This conference will now be recorded. All right, um, welcome to part three of our SARS-CoV-2 data submissions training. Um, today, we're gonna go over how to navigate through the different um, submission wizards online through the web portals for GISAID and NCDI. Okay, so just a reminder, this is part three of a five part uh, training series. After part three, um, we'll have individual calls with each jurisdiction. If you would like, if you're trying to troubleshoot any of your submissions or need more clarification on something, um, also please let me know if one of the scripts doesn't work with your data files, if they're formatted differently, and I'll be sure to make edits to those to make sure that they're working for everyone as needed. After that, we'll have part four and part five to go over the fast queue dehosts or to remove any human reads from um, any of the uh, fast queue files and to go over SRA submissions of those. And then part five um, might be one part or it might, I might split it into two parts because there's a lot of information to go over for that for the flag sample review, variant confirmation, and assembly collection. So today's outline, we're going to first start with how to submit to GISAID, then how to submit to Biosample, and how to submit to NCBI GenBank. Different labs you may talk to might do their submissions in different orders. Some use command line versions where they submit to GISAID and GenBank at the exact same time. Um, I think CDC actually submits to GenBank first, then they submit to GISAID. Um, we do it in this order. We submit to GISAID, then to Biosample, then to GenBank, and I'm going to go over the reasons why we do that. Um, for us, it's easiest, makes more sense, and more streamlined and able to link all your data together. So just a reminder, just our general SARS-CoV-2 sequencing workflow and the different files that we're getting out from that, our consensus assembly, sample metadata, which we're focusing on submitting for parts one through three. Um, and we'll, in part four, we'll focus on submissions of fast keys and beams to the, to the SRA later. So yesterday during part two, we went over the, the first top of, half of a list of creating, screening our samples, creating our, um, multi FASTA files on hypergators. So moving forward to the next steps, you assume that you have all your metadata collected, you have um, everything batched together, all your samples renamed, your FASTA files are ready to go for submission. So today's factor is gonna go over everything that's in blue, which involves the actual submission part. So the first submission I recommend is submitting to GISAID first. Um, the input files for the submission are the metadata template. It's just an Excel file that you can download from GISAID. I'll be providing it for you. Um, I do recommend checking on their site. Once in a while, they'll make updates. They do not notify anyone of those updates. Um, but if they ever make an update to their template um, where there's now required fields that you weren't aware of, they'll just reject your submission and you need to go back and use the new template. But um, I'll, re I'll require or be providing that and we'll walk through how to fill that out. And then you have from the previous submission, your formatted multi FASTA file. And then we go through these main steps here where you log in, you select the upload tab, you can select single upload if you're only submitting one file. And then, but we'll be going over how to do the batch upload. All you do is attach your files, select your new confirmation option, which we'll go over and then hit submit. And then we choose your session backwards. So we'll be going over each one of those um, steps. So I'm gonna start with a demo first of um, how, because before I ever even like sign in and start doing the submission, I always prepare my, all my metadata and my template file first. So I'm gonna pull that up and we're gonna walk through that really quick. So I'll be providing this for you, but it's also something I'll show, I'll show you in a second where you can download that from GISAID. Um, so this is what the, it's just an Excel file. This is their metadata template that you have to fill out. Let me zoom in just so it's a little bit bigger on the screen so you can see. Um, this first tab here, they have the instructions and they have all the column information and then just information and gives you, it gives you examples on how to format all of your fields. Everything in pink here is um, a required field and anything in black is optional. They also indicate that here based on whether it says mandatory or not. And then they give you different information or examples on what you need to put in each column. So I'll walk through each. So the submitter column, so in here on the instructions, they have it in pink and here it's in orange. So all the orange fields are required, um, black fields are optional, but I will show you a couple that I do recommend that you do fill out for the optional. So submitted, that's just your GISA username that's tied with your account, so it stays the same. The 
the FASTA file name, this one would be need to be the exact file name as what we generated on Hypergator. And so all of this, obviously, is just example data that I'm showing you, but you can use it as your guide. So this is the name of our file, the virus name. So this is what I showed you yesterday, how we renamed our samples. This is the GISA name, so it has the H519 prefix, and then the USA base name here. Type beta coronavirus, this stays the same, never changes. SARS cov 2 is the beta coronavirus. Passage details history. The vast majority of the time, it's going to be, or all the time, it'll be original because it's your original clinical sample. Any other information will be if you are culturing the virus, which I don't think anyone here is doing. Um, and that's where you would put the passage details, but the clinical, regular diagnostic testing, so between clinical samples, it's just original, we've got the same. This is the collection date, it needs to be formatted just like this, four digit year, month, day. Location needs to be formatted just like this. So it'll be North America. Remember there are spaces, picky, there are spaces on either side of these forward slashes, they need to be there. The North America, your spaces, USA, and then your state. So this is the state based on where that sample was collected, not where that, not where that the residence of the person or the patient. It's where the sample was collected. Same thing um, in your, which I went over this yesterday, which state you include in your name. This is where the sample was collected from. Not not state of residence. Um, put your host. So the majority, I think most people are sequencing from human, but if you ever do sequence something from an animal, um, make sure and put the appropriate host. So one of the black fields that's optional is sampling strategy. This is where you're going to put your information for a purpose of a reason of sequencing that CDC is recommending that everybody do. So um, for GISAID, it is if it's just part of your baseline surveillance where it's just your representative samples that you're you know, pulling from your diagnostic testing that's coming into the lab and doing random surveillance on that, that would be baseline surveillance. So put that here. Anything that you're selecting uh, for, for a reason to sequence, if it's part of an investigation, outbreak cluster, if you're looking at it because of disease severity, um, breakthrough infections, um, you know, targeted a school to monitor. So I mean, that's all targeted surveillance. Um, only include just pure random sampling to your representative samples as your baseline surveillance. CDC wants everyone to tag, they're kind of tagging to tag your baseline surveillance and targeted surveillance samples like this um, so that if they're properly tagged, they can start pulling in state public health generated data um, to include in their modeling and their reporting online because um, prior to that, they had only been including the NS3 samples that we send to them and then the contract lab data. Um, but now as um, jurisdictions that are sequencing start tagging their samples properly in the databases, they will then start pulling in your samples that you are sequencing to be used in those numbers as well. So we just get a better picture of what's going on around the country. Um, gender, patient age, and patient status are required fields. Most labs do not report up this information. We do not. I would assume most of y'all aren't either. Just put unknown. That's what they want you to put. Um, if you have a required field but that you're not going to fill in, just put unknown. Sequencing technology. This would be the sequencing platform that you used. Assembly method. I recommend these are optional fields, assembly method and coverage. However, I highly recommend that you do fill them out. It gives other people who are using your data more information so that they know how that data was generated. Um, the coverage information also is very informative because they have different filter options and features on this age where people can filter out um, like low coverage samples or select only high coverage samples. And because this aid does not accept raw sequencing data, just the consensus assemblies, you need this information to put in there to indicate whether it is, it is a high coverage or low coverage sample. So I highly recommend that you do fill these in. Assembly method, it's just going to be the pipeline use. So, like for example, if you use the dragon for the lineage app, then just put that here. Um, if you know the exact assembler name in your pipeline, um, then you can go ahead and put that here. This is an example. If you're using a Flock SC2 pipeline that we generated here in Florida, this is the assembler for read mapper and the program that does the assembly from the read mapping uh, for the assembly. So just put, put the name of your pipeline. Um, and then the other required fields are originating lab and address. Some labs will do this differently. So if you get, if a sample was collected, for example, at a hospital or something, um, that potentially would be the originating lab and then they send it to you for sequencing and then therefore you'd be the submitting lab. 
However, we don't put extra information like that in there because then it gives extra data about, oh, this was potentially a hospitalized patient from this hospital or whatnot. So we here in Florida just put our public health lab name for both the originating lab and the submitting lab, even if for some samples, if they originated in a different clinic or hospital and then came here for sequencing, we still put originating lab so that we're not releasing any additional information about that particular sample. So that's up to y'all's lab, but this is what we do here in Florida. The so one's submitting lab and address, those are required fields. And then the last required field is office. So again, this is up to your lab who you include. We put um, our molecular lead and our bioinformatics staff on here who are doing the data analysis and data generation. Some labs will include their entire sequencing teams and bioinformatics teams. It's up to you, but just whoever you want to give authorship credit for, for for the data. So after you fill that in, you just hit save and you're done with that. Go we'll back to the slides. All right. So we have our metadata template filled in, that's the file that you generated on Hypergator, and now we're going to walk through the different steps. So you'll log into Hypergator and sign in, and it takes you to this page here. You're going to click on the upload button. I'm going to give you the option to do a single upload or a batch upload. The vast majority of the time, you'll click on batch upload. This is where you're submitting more than one sample at a time. Um, there's been a few times where I've used the single upload button. It just pops up like an online form that you fill out all the information as opposed to attaching your um, Excel template. I've done that if I've had to, like, if I had one sample that got flagged in a submission, I had to correct it or something and then resubmit it. Um, I then use the single upload. Or if there is, um, you know, a high priority sample, something like that, that we needed to get the accession really quick for to give to someone. I just submitted that one super quick as a single upload. So, so there are times where you might use that. But the vast majority of the time, you'll, you'll be using the, the batch upload. Um, it always pops up, I just wanted to point this out, it always pops up this notification that there is a way to um, upload your samples using a command line interface. We don't use that because all of our metadata is on our local computers. I find it pretty simple and straightforward for filling out the Excel templates and how we um, keep everything organized. So. Um, there is that option if you want to use it. Um, I think the way we do it is, is pretty simple and allows for um, a more efficient way of organizing everything and making sure we don't skip over anything. You just have to hit OK to acknowledge it. So this is this the submission sheet essentially. You're going to it's going to ask for you to um, upload your metadata file. So it's the Excel template that you just filled out. It's going to ask to upload your um, FASTA file. So that's the multi FASTA file that you would have generated on Hypergator. Um, and then I'm going to point out this new option that's, that hasn't been here that long, but it's now making the submission process a lot more um, friendly in that it is accepting more sequences. So after you attach your two files, um, you'll select one of these confirmation options, and I'm going to go over in detail what they mean. There's three choices to choose from. Um, I will point out, too, that, and I'll go over this, on GenBank, the submission limit, you can submit up to 1,000 genomes at a time. They say they give you a max file size, so this is 32 megabytes. Um, it's I think the most <clears throat> the, mo the most uh, genomes I've ever submitted before. I think was a little over 800, and um, and that was obviously fine for GenBank, but fine for GSA too. So it probably equals out to, to around a thousand as well. Just wanted to point that out. Um, <clears throat> before I get to the going over in more detail on the confirmation options, I also want to point out. This button down here where it says download instructions and template. This is where you can um, check from time to time if they've updated that Excel template. Um, like I said, they don't, they usually don't make any kind of notification to say that they have, um, but you can you can always get a new a new copy here if you need that for anything. Um, okay, so yeah, we're gonna go over now to select the confirmation options. So as I said, this is a new feature. It allows you to, it basically allows for an improved submission process to streamline and confirm more samples through submission. Before, there was a bigger issue with, you would prepare, let's say, for example, you prepared a 500 sample submission. You would usually get back, um, you know, 20% or 15% or 10% of those samples would get flagged and would get rejected. 
and they would get flagged for a number of reasons. Um, most of the time it was because there was a frame shift mutation in one of the genes or a SNP that causes an early stop codon. Um, sometimes it's because there's an actual problem with the sequence that there was a you know sequencing or something. But the vast majority of the time, the frame shift mutations were just due to novel mutations that were just part of new lineages. Um, and the old process was you had to, they would reject your samples, you'd have to review your samples, then you have to send them an email and confirm saying, nope, yep, these are real mutations, here's the frequency of that SNP, here's the, the depth of that site, and then they would um, accept your samples. And so it did cause a lot of delays. A lot of the labs didn't want to do that because one, taking the time to manually review those samples and having someone trained to be able to do that um, and so those samples often just got um, pushed to the side until labs could deal with them later. And what that did is it created an undersampling and underrepresentation or underrepresentation of novel lineages in the databases. Um, so this happened when like B117 was first on the scene, and then they soon corrected that so that B117 didn't get blocked anymore. And then um, same thing with some of the some of the other mutations. So they recently made this option to where um, you can select a few different options to provide how any frame shifts have been um, confirmed. So the three options are, the first one is the default option where it says, and I put this in blue, this is the exact text that you'll see in the drop down menu. It says, notify me about all the types of frame shifts in the submission for reconfirmation of affected samples. The default is essentially the old way. So that means they will reject all of your flag samples. So any samples that have any frame shifts in them, they will reject all of them. And they require you to send an email confirming those. And then you have to reach some of the samples. So it takes a little bit longer. The second, the second option is notify me only about not previously reported frame shifts in the submission for reconfirmation of effective sequences. So essentially what that means is that if you as a submitter or any other submitter has previously reported a particular frame shift at a particular site and confirmed that it's real, then GISAID keeps a record of that and then that they will not flag your samples. They will accept these samples. Um, so this is now in Florida, this is our new default that we use. We always use the second, second option because if any other submitter has um, confirmed a frame shift, it saves us a significant amount of time. They're only going to reject samples where a frame shift mutation has not been previously reported. So um, now that we've started using this option, we haven't had any flag samples from this right now. Um, you still could, but um, we, we haven't, especially if you're screening your samples with Vader first, then you're using the second option. The vast majority of the time, almost all of your samples should, or all of them should be getting through and not being rejected. So the last option is I confirm any frame shifts in this submission and request their release without reconfirmation by curator. Only, only, only select this option if you personally have manually reviewed every single sample in that submission um, so that you are confirming those frame shifts. Um, you're only going to use this option if you had some previously flagged samples that you've gone back to review um, so that you can provide that confirmation. Then. Um, we would select this option. This also eliminates the step of you no longer have to email them because selecting that option takes place of that confirmation email. So you can just, just use that option. So if you want to deal with flagged samples, use the first option. Here in Florida, our new default is the second option. So basically anything else that's been previously reported by us or someone else will allow our, our samples to go through and be accepted. Um, and then we only use that third option if these are samples that were previously flagged, either if they had novel frame shift mutations or if they had errors and then that we had to then correct. So they've all been manually reviewed and then resubmit. We'll use that last option just for that. Okay, so after you've selected your confirmation option, then you'll just hit uh, verify and submit at the bottom and then. It'll, it'll go through, it'll indicate that it's processing and everything, making sure that there's no errors in your metadata sheet, all that kind of stuff, your samples match. And then um, if everything goes through correctly, it'll say completed and your data has been successfully submitted. So GISID will, they usually um, will provide your accessions back um, either in about a day or two. It could be in as little as an hour or two. Sometimes it takes a few hours. Um, but it might not be till the next day. It just it kind of depends. 
they send you an email. So whatever email is linked to your account, they send you an email and they say whether your samples have been uh, accepted or whether they've been rejected. If they've been accepted, they send you an email with a list of all of your sessions just in the email, no file. It's not very helpful because they don't link them to your sample name. So you have no idea to know which is a session is which sample name, which is really annoying. So for GISAID, you have to manually retrieve your sessions yourself if you want to keep a record of everything. Um, so I'm about to show you how to do that. And here's kind of just a general step-by-step -step instructions here on the slide, but I'm going to show you how to do that. Okay. So log in and you'll when you first log in, you will come to the BCOB site. You'll go to search. You'll then search by your state. And then we'll search by the submission date. So I think we did a submission on the 15th. Okay. And then I like, you can hit this virus name and it will sort them for you. So I can see my samples that I submitted on the 15th. Um, it'll pop up everything. So there's these yellow samples here, but it'll attach the, the I can recognize and see all my BPHL samples. The, and these are the samples I'm looking for, I'm looking for these numbers. Um, and you can just check all, download, patient status metadata, download. I will note too that if you, um, that's why on the Excel sheet that I gave you where you keep a record of your submission date so that you can go back, especially if it's been a day or two or over the weekend, you know what date to look for. Um, I will point out that sometimes if you don't, if you Put your filter by your submission date and you don't see your data, try the day after um, because sometimes it will be available to you on, for example, like 915, but it might have got a might have been recorded as 916. And I think it's because there's curators all over the world that are curating these samples. And it could be because their time zones differently, because I've noticed that work. I've submitted things on one day, it's been accepted on that day, I can see it on that day, but then it's listed as the next day of the submission date. So I just wanted to point that out just in case you don't see it, try the day after. So it's now been downloaded um, and I can open this and we can open it up. And it's just a tab separated file. So this looks very familiar. I showed you how to do this yesterday, um, but this is how you can retrieve your session. So I then like to then um, sort by the virus name. And now I can see pull out my, like these are my samples. So I can just copy, copy paste all of my BPHL uh, sessions. Like that, and then cop and then copy them back into your your log how you're documenting them. So that's how that's how you can retrieve your session. Okay. Okay. So now you have your guest data sessions, and you're ready to move on to um, the NC sessions. Um, I will make this note here that if you do have reject, if you submit, let's say you submit 100 samples to guest aid, and you have some that come back as rejected, they'll indicate that in an email. You have a couple different options. It just depends on what you want to do. Um, the first option is to just make a record of the samples that get rejected um, and move on to, and just deal with them later and move on to your NCI submission. But I will recommend that you do rerun the SC2 FASTA for sub Python script on Hybrator to regenerate your multi FASTA file for GenBank to remove their samples so that your submissions match. So that when you go back, because you want to you want to investigate why they got rejected, if there was some type of error or anything, and so because you don't want something to go into GenBank that gets accepted as in, is not in GSA. Um, some labs are doing that, just keeping your record and going back. But I highly recommend to try to keep everything the same and make sure that whatever you have in one database matches the other. Um, all you have to do if you need to regenerate your FASTA file, um, you don't have to worry about like 
recapping over assemblies or deleting out assemblies out of your input folder, all you need to do is just edit that, that two column file that you made in Excel that you saved as a tab delimited uh, file. Just remove the samples from that input file that you don't want anymore and just transfer over to Hypergear, rerun it, and, um, and then it'll create a new FASTA file for GenBank that only has the samples that were just accepted and visited. So that's what I recommend you do if, um, if you're not going to review your rejected samples right now, just to make sure that everything uh, matches. Um, or you can choose to just take care of it then and there. Review those five samples, see what the issue is, see if um, if there's, for example, like if there's a novel friendship mutation and you just need to resubmit and send a confirmation, great, go ahead and do that. And then you can go ahead and move on to your NCBI submissions. And there's no need to remake your FASTA file or anything because you didn't make any kind of corrections. It was just something that needed to be confirmed. Um, but you, if you needed to review your samples and let's say you needed to make a correction to a, a FASTA sequence, you can go ahead and do that, which again, we're going to be going over all of that in part five um, of the training. Make that correction, um, edit, remake your FASTA file those corrections, resubmit the rejected samples to get it, and then move forward with NCBI. So there's a couple different options. Before you're trained on doing like sample review, sample confirmation correction, and things like that, I recommend going with the first option to just make a record of which ones got rejected remake your FAFSA file to exclude those for the GenBank submission and just go with, with GenBank. And then once you're trained on doing sample review and, and assembly correction, then you can do the second option. That's what we do here at Florida is we do the second option. Okay, so you've finished your GIS data session or uh, submission. So now you can move on to submitting to uh, NCBI BioSample. So this requires just an Excel template to be filled out, and that's it. And you just submit this out. So I just have some general steps here of where to go and what to do, but I'm about to, to walk you through that as well. I'm going to walk you through it on slides just because um, you have to have an actual, like, real submission um, for Biosample and for GenBank to move forward with some of the submission wizards. So I've done screenshots, and I'm going to walk you through just like that. Um, but first, I'm going to walk you through how to I'll do a demo of how to fill out the Excel file. So the Excel files, again, I'll share this one with you. They're called um, packages. They're called packages. This is what NCBI calls them. Um, you can download them um, on uh, NCBI's website um, on their biosample page. Um, if you have any questions about how to find them, uh, let me know, and, and I can direct you to that. But I'll be sharing this with you. This is their SARS-CoV-2 specific file package. When SARS-CoV-2, well, when COVID first started, um, they didn't have this one, so we were using just their clinic, they're just their general clinical pathogen bio package. And by bio package, it's literally just a difference in the Excel, the Excel template. Um, but now there is a specific clinical SARS-CoV-2 one uh, with fields relevant to SARS-CoV-2. So the first, everything in green is mandatory, everything in yellow is optional, but there are a few yellow fields that that you need to fill out. Um, so for the sample name, as you can see, this is our, our base public sample name along with the NCDI prefix. So the SARS-CoV-2 and the human or the host, obviously if you sequence something from a different host, please get that. Um, this is where you're gonna put your bio project session. So this is this is not the CDC umbrella bio project. This is your individual lab bio project session that you have created that I went over on uh, in the part one training. Um, we're gonna, this will just stay the same. Oh, I accidentally mistake. When I pulled down, be careful when you pull down Excel fields. Um, so this will stay the same for uh, for anything that you submit. It's just um, the full name of the organism collected by. We put our lab um, for everything, even if it was collected by like another clinic or something. We just we put our lab to sequence it. The put the full collection date needs to be formatted just like this, the year, month, day. Um, the location is formatted just like this USA colon and then the state of your name. Or sorry, the name of your state. I can't talk today. Um, your host, they want it formatted like this, Homo sapiens, uh, host disease, COVID-19. And then this is isolate for NCBI isolate and your sample name. They could be different things or the same things. And I'll explain the difference. So the isolate is that specific viral isolate from your clinical sample. 
So if you were to potentially sequence it multiple times using different methods and you wanted to submit those, the separate genetic data that you get from that using different methods if you wanted to, technically you could have different sample names. We don't do that, just our, whatever is that isolate from that clinical sample, that is our sample name. Even if sometimes we've sequenced things in duplicate, we never submit more than one sample from the same patient. So there's just one sample from one patient in the databases. So here in Florida, our isolate name is the same as our sample name, but technically they're different things. Um, isolation source, we just put clinical. If you know, you can put like the swab or if this came, if it was something that came from like a tissue sample or something like that, you could indicate that here. This is the isolation source. We just put clinical. This is how you can link your GISAID data to biosample, and this is highly recommended to fill in. And this is why I recommend you submit to GISAID first, wait till you get your accessions before you move on to this. So that way you can copy in your accessions for those samples here, and you can also put in that virus name. So that's the same base name as the NCBI name, except with the H5 prefix. So that's why I recommend you submit to GISAID first so that all of your data can be linked across the database. The other yellow field, you, I mean, you can on your own look through all these. Most people are not going to be filling these in as like vaccination information or prior infection. You might if you're doing some study or there's IRB approval to do all that, but um, we don't fill up that information. But if you are, you can. Purpose of sequencing. So this is the field that you're going to use to tag your baseline samples and, and targeted surveillance samples for CDC so that they can then pull in your gen bank data once you submit that to use that for all of their reporting and modeling and everything like that. Um, you can fill out the purpose of sampling here. So if it you know, came to your lab um, for diagnostic testing or whatnot, you can fill that in here. But the main field to fill out to make sure that your sequence data gets included in CDC um, numbers is to do this. So with GISAID, it was just baseline surveillance. For biosample, it is baseline surveillance with in parentheses random sampling. Um, they're in the process of, we've been on some of the toast calls, they're in the process of updating their guidance that they've shared with APHL that you might have seen on how to tag those baseline surveillance samples. It did not include the information or the wording for biosample. It's still in CDC clearance uh, right now. Dewani said on one of the calls, but, um, but she indicated that this is the wording to use. So on your biosample sheet for any baseline surveillance, do baseline surveillance random sampling, and any targeted surveillance to do it. Um, and then the last yellow field that we fill in is sequence by and just put your lab name. So you fill out all that information, hit save as an Excel file, and you're good to go. Um, so now we're going to walk through um, how to the what the biosample submission result looks like. So you'll go to the link I had on the previous slide. It'll pop up to this page. Um, here's the submit button. You'll click that. Um, it's going to take you to, so you should have an NCBI account. Make sure you're logged in so you see your username up here. You'll see any previous submissions you've ever done for other types of samples down below. Um, click on the new submission button. It's first going to take you to a page to put your submitter information in. Um, if you've done NCBI submissions before, this should auto-populate with all of your information if you're signed in. If it's not, just make sure to fill it in. There's more to it when you scroll down and then hit continue. So the first page is going to ask, when do you want this to be released to the public? Do release immediately. And then we're doing a batch um, submission. If for some reason you're only doing one sample, for whatever reason, just make sure you put single bio sample, um, but we're doing batch submissions. Um, so after that, you're going to select your sample type. So this indicates which package, bio sample package you're using. We are, you'll select this first option here where it starts cov 2 clinical. Um, more of the options when you scroll down, I just wanted to point this out. Um, if you ever start sequencing SARS-CoV-2 wastewater and submitting that data, they do have a specific SARS-CoV-2 wastewater bio package that is different. So make sure to use that if you're ever doing wastewater surveillance. But for any of your regular um, clinical samples, make sure to use the SARS-CoV-2 clinical, which is what we just filled out. So then it's going to ask how you want to provide those biosample attributes. That's just your metadata. You're going to click upload a file since we just filled that out, and you're going to upload that Excel file. It's going to pop up this option, how to attach your file. Hit choose file, or you can drag and drop. Hit continue, and you'll see it attached here. 
then hit continue. Um, and that's just the Excel file that we just filled out. Then after that, it's going to pop up to this page. You hit submit. And it'll take you back to your main submission portal page where you'll now see the submission associated with the submission number. And it'll say submitted awaited processing. Um, Biosamples, assuming you don't have an issue with your Excel sheet, you've filled out everything correctly, they're very quick. Sometimes you'll get your accessions within about 10 minutes. Sometimes it might be 15 or 20, but it's very quick if there's no issue. So what I recommend you do is start filling out, preparing your GenBank submission and start filling out that uh, metadata template. So by the time you get to the point where you need to copy in your biosample accessions, you'll receive the email, you'll have your accessions and be all ready to go. So that's what I recommend. Um, in CBI Biosample, you just get your sessions. You don't have to go retrieve them like you do on GISAID. You just get them, like I said, in an email. It's in a text file. And you can open it up in Excel. I do recommend that you open it up in Excel and um, so always sort based on the sample name prior to popping your sessions back into like your log file or anything like that because sometimes they're not always in order. Biosample, Biosample usually keeps things in order based on your sample name. But it's not guaranteed, so it's always safe to, to sort them before just to make sure you don't accidentally copy something um, out of order. So, like I said, those usually come within like 10 to 20 minutes. So I recommend you just start preparing your GenBank submission. And then by the time you get to the step where you need your biosample sessions, you're good to go. So last step in the process is now submitting those consensus assemblies that you generated. GenBank. So you'll have your multi file that you generated on Hypergator, and you'll have a metadata template, just an Excel file um, that you fill out. I've listed all the main steps here, the link to go to, what to click. We're going to walk through it again. I'm also going to note, though, that when you do get your sessions from GenBank, they email them to you. Make, absolutely make sure that you sort them by name in Excel before you copy them over, because the vast majority of the time from GenBank, I've noticed, they are not in order by sample. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, so that no one has copied anything. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through how to fill out, and again, I'm going to be sharing this with you, how to fill out the metadata template for GenBank. So it's just um, an Excel sheet that you make, and it's going to ask for your sequence ID, which is your sample name. Your It's going to say country, but it needs to be the country colon and then your state, host human, or again, if you've sequenced something from another host. Isolate, this is just like on the bio sample. So if you're, so like here in Florida, our isolate name is the exact same name as our sample name. If you use different names, then indicate so there, but um, that's the next field. Collection date, again, that needs to be the full collection date. And I'll, I don't know if I've said this before of why it's important to have your full collection date, because some people have tried to submit things with just the year or just the month because they didn't want to release the full collection date. <clears throat> so the full collection date is required for any kind of downstream file genetic analysis. If it's not, for example, like next string builds, things like that, if you don't have a full collection date, it's going to be kicked out of the analysis and it's not going to be used. Now, your data can still be used for other things, um, but for the things that are really important, especially trying to track the spread of SARS-CoV-2, uh, looking at the mutation rate, things like that, you have to have a full collection date. So I just want to say that's super important. Now, we have had people have asked me, what do we do if you don't have a full collection date? We've had, I mean, out of the thousands of samples that we've sequenced, there's maybe been a handful or less. But where, for whatever reason, a full collection date was not collected and it's nowhere in our limb system or anything, we only had a year, go ahead and still submit it. Just put the year. But um, if you have access to that full collection date, include it. Because otherwise, the information is not as useful if you do not have that full collection date. I just want to repeat that and emphasize that. Um, isolation source is clinical for clinical sample. Here's where you'll paste in your biosample sessions. So that's why you need to wait for your biosamples to go through first before you submit to, uh, to GenBank so that you can paste in your biosample sessions. Um, put your bio project. So again, this is your individual lab bio project. So um, make sure to put that in there for your source cov sequencing. And then you have to have this field here. It's called note. Um, to indicate the GISAID session information, and it needs to be formatted just like this with GISAID, a session, colon, and then this. So on the second sheet here, I just have a scratch space where you can paste, you can just paste in your um, GISAID session, and it will attach this information here. So then you can just copy from this field and paste it back in here. Um, that was just a requirement by GenBank that it be formatted like that. 
So I always save this as an Excel file, just so I have a copy of the Excel file of what I did, so that it always saves the second sheet and I can just use it for the next submission. I just delete out everything and just reuse the template and it just serves as my guide for the next one. But you also need to save it as a tab delimited text file because when you submit to GenBank, um, they will not accept an Excel file. It has to be a tab delimited text file. So I always save as Excel, save as text template. That way you have the Excel sheet for your next submission to use as a guide. Um, and it'll save the second sheet with the scratch space. Um, but you need that text file for the, for the actual GenBank submission. So we're going to walk through how to then submit to GenBank once you now have your FASTA file and your um, Excel template ready to go. So you'll go to the link that I have in the previous slide. It's going to pop you up to this page that they made specific for submitting your SARS-CoV-2 sequences. They have GenBank, and then later on, we'll go over how to submit to the sequence read archive. So click on Submit for GenBank. It's going to look very similar to your submission portal for BioSample, but it's going to be different for GenBank, and you can see it keeps a record of all your previous submissions. Um, so if you ever do need to go back actually in the past and uh, if, let's say you accidentally lost the file or couldn't find the email with the previous sessions, you can always go back to your submission portal and get a list of your sessions there. So hit new submission. It's going to ask you what kind of submission type could they allow for other types for different um, viruses or different types of sequences uh, using this particular portal. So click on the one that um, allows for the option for SARS-CoV-2. It's then going to pop up from that list which virus in particular. So you hit SARS-CoV-2, and you can just do continue. You don't you don't need to fill out a submission title. So it's going to pop up the same page asking for the submitter information. Again, you should be logged into your NCGI account. This should auto-populate. If it doesn't fill it in, but it should be. So I usually never have to touch this page. Just hit continue. So next, it's going to ask you what methods were used to obtain the sequences. So you'll click which, which technology you use. Um, most labs are using Illumina. Some people are using um, Oxford Manipur, which you would do other for that one. Um, so indicate the appropriate type, and then you also need to indicate whether these are assembled sequences, which they are, they're assembled. So you'll click this second option here. Um, this is why I recommend that you batch your submissions because of these GenBank options based on sequencing technology and assembly type. So if you, um, let's say you had submitted things on different platforms, you did some on Illumina and you did some on the Minion, I just recommend just group everything Illumina together and then group everything Oxford and Manipur together um, to do that to make things easier so that basically that these options can apply to all of your samples in the submission. So when you click on assembled sequences, it's going to ask for the assembly information for that. And again, this is why I recommend that you batch everything based on something that's analyzed together using the same platform. So this is just going to be either the program that you use or this. If you know the specific assembly program name, then put that here. Again, these are the options that we put for our flock SC2 pipeline. We use BWA and IBAR. Um, but just put the name of your pipeline. It's going to ask you when to release to the public, release immediately, and then it's going to ask you to upload your FASTA file. So this is we're going to upload that multi-FASTA file that you generated on paper reader. It's then going to, it's going to have a bunch of stuff pop up at the top in this yellow bar, indicating that it's processing, it's parsing through your FASTA file, making sure everything's formatted correctly. It's checking for like vector contamination and other types of things. Um, and so when it's finished, it's then going to ask you, you're also going to uh, indicate, you've already indicated that you want to reset immediately. But then when you finish it, if there's any warnings, they're going to pop up on that page. And here's two that I get every single time. So, and it, and you don't need to take any action, just hit continue. But it says the following sequences were trimmed of ambiguous spaces. So our script trims all the ends that might be at the beginning of the genome, but GenBank will trim any ends that are at the end of the genome for you. So that's just what they did, that's fine. And then they also are indicating that they found ends um, internally in the genome. So, um, like, you know, in some of the, the gene regions, which again is fine. You're going to have the majority of your samples, or many of them, you're not going to have a complete genome. You might have a few ends here and there. Sometimes you might have a whole gene missing if an amplicon dropped out or something. That's fine. Um, you just, just hit continue. But they do want you to indicate what do those internal ends represent? Because some programs put 
for every base, so one N equals one base. So if you had 10 bases with low coverage that could not be called in your consensus assembly, you're gonna have 10 Ns. Um, there are some programs out there that um, if you had 10 Ns, they would just make it one N in your sequence. Um, so you have to indicate whether it's an estimated length so that's where we know that 10 ends equals 10 bases, or if it's unknown to you, um, or if you know that that program that you're using takes those 10 ends and only puts one. Um, the vast majority of programs, so Secret and Dragon and our Flock SC2, the vast majority of programs, um, one N is one base. So you would click this, or you would click this first action here where we know the length, the actual length of the ends that are represented in the sequence. Um, I put a note here that only select this um, option here if it's if it's truly unknown, or if you know for a fact that your program reduces any string of ends down to one. But the majority of you should be choosing this first one. Um, it then leaves up, these are things you've already filled out. So the re release immediately and the FASTA file, you just hit continue after you've made your selection regarding them. So this is a new-ish option. It's been around for uh, several weeks, couple months, maybe something like that. Um, but NCDI made, they originally did not have it. If you were doing uh, sars cov 2 submissions several months ago, they did not have this option. And they used to, if you had any kind of flagged or failed samples, they didn't reject them like GISID did. GISID would accept whatever passed and then they would just reject whatever got rejected and send you an email. NCBI would hold up your entire submission and not accept any of it until you address the, um, the, the flag samples. So you either had to remove the flag samples from your submission and then continue with your submission, um, or you had to send them an email saying, oh, no, I know these are flags. Here's the confirmation for these mutations. They've now added this new option to um, kind of essentially act like the GISID option where it was to automatically remove failed sequences. So this is up to your lab, what you want to do. The first option, yes, so it says during processing, should NCBI remove sequences with errors and process threats? So if you click yes, that means that any samples that get flagged um, will just automatically be rejected. NCBI is not going to accept them. They will accept everything else that passes, and they'll send you an email saying which samples were, were rejected, and then you can then go and deal with them on your own later, either review them or just choose not to, to submit them. If you select the second option, no, that means it'll act like their prior, their prior default, where um, if you do have samples that get flagged, they will hold up your entire submission. It will stay in processing until you either choose to remove those five samples from your FASTA file and then continue on, or if you address the issue, like if you if you reviewed those samples and you need to confirm mutation. So again, I recommend that you choose the first option, yes, if you are not trained to review manual review samples, or if you don't have the time, you're gonna batch them and give them to, to someone else to do later, um, I recommend that you choose yes. You shouldn't, um, you shouldn't receive any flag samples. The fact that we're pre-screening with Vader, which is the same program that you're using, as long as Vader is up to date. Um, and I monitor it to make sure that it is up to date. There has been a time where I did miss an update and I got a flag sample and I was wondering why, it was because I missed one of their updates. But um, you shouldn't get any, or you should get very few, but you shouldn't get any. Um, if you do choose yes, and if you've already pre-screened with Vader. So again, that's why we pre-screen our samples with Vader on Hypergator first, so that it just streamlines this process and you don't have to, you don't hit new bottlenecks or anything in this area. Now, if you would like to review your samples in real time, that's what we do here in Florida, we um, select the no option so that they will hold up our submission so that we can review those samples. But we also pre-screen everything with Vader first, so we we batch everything in the past past samples anyway so even if we do select no we should also still have zero flag samples or very few and when we have very few it's manageable to be able to review those in real time and then anything that got reviewed when uh, anything that got flagged on hypergator when we were doing our screen ourselves those are things that we just hold back anyways on purpose and when we have the time to go back and review them we do so we choose no, um, but I will point out though, if you do get to the point where you are 
reviewing your samples, your flag samples, because you ran beta yourself um, and you recognize which ones require manual review. When you decide, oh, yep, these are real mutations, I need to confirm them, or you made uh, corrections to your assembly, make sure you always choose the no option when doing the submission because what NCBI is going to do is it's going to recognize that those are still flag samples. And if you hit no, they'll hold it up. And all you have to do is then just shoot them an email saying, here's my confirmation for these samples. And they go, oh, okay. And then they release your samples. Um, if you, if you, choose the yes option when you're trying to resubmit flag samples that you've already reviewed, they're just going to keep on rejecting them over and over and over again because they're going to reject it before you have time to send them an email. Um, so I recommend choosing yes, the yes option then if you're not re manually reviewing your samples yet, choose yes. Um, if you are manually reviewing them in real time, just hit no or once you get to that step where you're trying to review them and you're submitting Higher flags, in fact, or uh, higher flag samples than um, than choose the no option. Okay, so the next screen it's going to ask, um, do your sequence IDs represent one of these? So if your sample name and your isolate name are the exact same, then choose isolate. If you're using different names, then choose none of these. So the next screen is asking for your source modifiers. So source modifiers are just, that's just your metadata. That's the Excel sheet that we filled out. So you'll select to upload a tab delimited table, and then it's gonna pop up the screen here on the right, asking for you to attach a file. <laughs> and then you just attach your file and hit continue. So the last page is, or the second to last page, it's gonna ask for your references. So this is just your sequence authors. So um, you'll just fill it the first time you ever fill it in, you'll have to actually fill in first name, last name, and then if add the other author, first name, last name, first name, last name. Um, once you've already done a submission, it'll save the authors from a prior submission to where then you can start using this drop down menu. And then you just select the list of authors, do apply sequence by authors and it will automatically fill this in for you. That way each time you don't have to keep filling it out each time, which saves you some time. Um, then select the appropriate button for whether this is published data or unpublished. The vast majority of us, it's going to be unpublished. This is just our samples that are coming in. We're not writing up papers right now. Um, if you ever do use some of this, this data in future publications, you can always email GenBank and update the publication issue with the paper afterwards. Um, but this will more than likely be unpublished data, so just click unpublish. It's then going to pop up something that here that says reference title, and that you just leave it blank. Uh, you don't need to fill that in. And then hit continue, and then you'll finally get to the last page where it says review and submit. And then you click submit. It's going to take you back to your submission portal page where you can then um, see the new submission that you just made and that it's submitted. If you ever have to, if there's ever any kind of issue with your submission and GenBank emails you, um, they usually, they'll include this in the email, but just for your own reference, that if you're ever needing to email GenBank about a submission, use this sub number here, just in reference to your submission so they know which submission that you're talking about so that they can um, go back to that. So real quick, so as I mentioned, they're gonna send you your accessions in, as a text file in an email. And when you get them, um, just make sure, again, I'm gonna read this, open it up in Excel and sort by the sample name. Um, so because Gen Bank, the majority of the time, for whatever reason, does not send them back in order. And so that way, whenever you're popping them back into an Excel sheet or however you're keeping track of all your submissions and linking them back, make sure you do that so they can sort it. Um, and if you remember from the Excel template I, I shared with you, it was yesterday, um, where you can, it's where you're assigning your public names. That's where we keep track of all of our sessions. So as each one of these steps is completed and we retrieve our sessions, that's where we're copying them in. So we have one Excel sheet with our lab session, with the GIS data session, with the biosample session, and with the GenBank session. And then eventually with the SRA session. So that way everything's linked and that if you ever have to give data to anyone, to CDC or to collaborators or for a study or anything, you have everything in one sheet right there. Okay, so I'm just gonna recap a few things here for our last couple of slides before we end. Um, so regarding consensus assembly submissions, you can prepare, because this, I know this seems like there's a lot of moving parts here with these submissions. There's several different, you know, Excel sheets you have to fill out, 
having to generate um, your FASTA file, popping your assemblies over. Um, it does, especially when you first start doing this, it seems like a lot and seems like it, it takes a lot of time. But with anything, as you do it more and more, um, you get really quick with it. I can do one of our batch submissions in sometimes under 30. I can go through this whole process in under 30 minutes sometimes now, depending on the sample number. For a larger submission, I can get it done in less than an hour. So as you do it more and more, it's it's not, not as um, complicated as it might seem at first. And um, you can prepare or recommend you do submissions like set a day once a week and just work on all of your samples that you sequence the for, for that week or the week prior and do them all in one batch. Um, you can prepare, as I mentioned, you can do a thousand genomes at a time for GenBank and GISAID equals out to about that size too. Just they just have it based on their file size. I think the largest submission I've done, we've done like over 800 in, in a submission. So um, also if you have like a backlog of sequences right now, if you haven't been submitting anything yet, um, you know, just choose whatever you think might be manageable. 500 samples at a time, 800 samples at a time, prepare those and just and get those submitted. Um, as I mentioned today, I recommend batching your submissions based on the sequencing technology and the assembly program that you use. So if you've sequenced different samples on different platforms, you're using different programs, um, it just, that way you can apply the correct information in the GenBank submissions to those um, all at once. So what we do is we batch all of our submissions based on, right now, based on like pass pass. So whether they pass QC and then they pass the Vader flag, and then we then um, batch them based on were these sequenced on an Illumina platform or were these sequenced on our Clear Labs platform, and um, and then submit those in, in separate batches. And that's what, that's what we do. Um, and then as we have time, we go back through and do our our Vader review samples as we review those. But again, we'll go through how to do that, how to adjust the, the flag samples in part five of the game. Um, also on Hypergator. Um, Yesterday when I was showing you how to copy over the scripts and um, like edit the SBAT script with your email and all that kind of stuff. Um, you don't have to do that every single time. You can just make like I have in my uh, user folder, I have a SARS CoV-2 folder I have on Hypergator in my user folder space on the Blue Drive, and I have a sequence submissions folder. And I just do that's just kind of like my um, scratch space to do all of my sequence submission preparation. So I just leave my scripts copied in there. So I don't have to recopy the scripts over. Um, I don't have to re-edit my SBAT scripts. So like my email is still in there, my input files, because our input files stay the same. That way I don't have to edit them at all. The only thing I have to do is edit the, well, you'll have to edit like the, the name file and that's it. But you don't have to edit like the, the file extension or email or anything like that. And, um, and I just use that and that speeds up the process each time. Um, I'll let you know, I'm gonna update, if there's ever any updates to beta or make any updates to the scripts, I will let you know so that you can copy over the new version and I'll make, make that update to beta for you. Um, also, when I'll just say this, when there is an update to beta, go back and rerun your previously flagged samples because They've made multiple updates um, over the last several months before they used to flag anything with a friendship mutation. Then they um, allowed exceptions for open reading frame eight. Um, that was a, a, a gene, an accessory gene that acquires a lot of friendship mutations. And it was constantly, those samples were constantly getting flagged in the databases and being rejected. Um, but the, they were all real, they were all real mutations. So because it was happening so frequently, NCBI made the decision to stop flagging open reading from eight samples that had friendship mutations in them. They've now done that to all the accessory genes. So open reading frame 3A, open reading frame 6, 7A, 7B, and 10, you no longer get flags for those samples if you have a friendship mutation in those genes. Um, so that means we have a whole, and we're still making our way through our backlog, we have a whole bunch of samples from several weeks and several months ago that were all flagged by Vader because they had likely, we haven't confirmed all of them yet, but likely because they had frame shifts in those genes. Um, and even CDC said, as they go back and they um, rerun their samples, it significantly, significantly reduces the number of flagged samples. So if you have a bunch of review samples, flagged samples from previous submissions that are just hanging out until you can get to them, go ahead and rerun them through Vader because um, they, Many of them, most of them likely pass now and then you can get those submitted. Um, also, if you ever need to correct or update a submission, let's say 
for whatever reason, you've submitted something to GISAID, you realize GenBank flagged it or vice versa, and you need to make an update to that FAFSA sequence, just go ahead and make that correction and just shoot them an email with a file attached with the updated FAFSA file, and they will make that change for you. Same goes with any kind of metadata. We I once submitted some samples and I realized I accidentally had the wrong collection date for whatever reason got copied over. Um, I just send them a list of the accessions and say, can you please update to this collection date? And they just go ahead and do that. They're very nice, very responsive. Um, so if there's ever any need for even any kind of um, submission questions um, or any kind of corrections, you can uh, shoot them an email. This is also what you'll do. So if you've already been uh, submitting some of your sequences and now this, um, CDC recommendation to tag your samples with their baseline or targeted surveillance for the purpose of sequencing. Um, for example, like here in Florida, we have a bunch of sequences that have been submitted that don't have those tags on them. We need to go back and add those tags on them. All you have to do is provide a list. You can do it like in a text file, Excel file, provide them a list of your sessions and then just give them that field, whether it's, and then that value, just base, you know, sample one, baseline surveillance, sample two, targeted surveillance. And just do that and just email all of them and they will and you can do this for a thousand or more you can do it for thousands of sequences uh, i think cdc said they just did it with like tens of thousands of sequences all at once and they go back and update all of them so if you ever do need to talk to anything that's just how you do it. you shoot them an email with that with that data information okay so um i recommend if you have questions, you want to walk through a submission hands-on with me on a, a Teams call, or we can share screens, please reach out to me, send me an email, um, and we'll set up those calls with, with either one by one with someone in your lab or with a whole group. We've done group calls before with your lab, and we'll walk through with your data, and you can we can walk through the entire process, and we can set up multiple calls if we need to if it goes over you know a couple of days waiting for those sessions, um, just to make sure that um, you're comfortable with doing the submissions and troubleshoot anything if necessary um, so that you're all good to go so that you're can be regularly submitting your consensus sets, consensus assembly. And once we get through all that, everybody's comfortable submitting everything, I'll go ahead and schedule the next two trainings. So the part four, how you submit your FAFQ files to the SRA, and then part five, how you, what do you do when you get a flagged sample, when a sample gets rejected, what do you do with it? And how do you confirm mutations? Because the vast major, I want to say like 99 or 99.9% .9 of the time, those samples are perfectly fine to submit either one of two things, confirming that those mutations are real, or there might be a slight error, like a one base clear insertion that shouldn't be there that was a sequencing error, and just making that one correction, just removing that one base clear insertion, and then sending it back. The vast majority of samples you can do that with. There's only ever been like a couple ever that we've done that just we just didn't feel comfortable submitting it because of the quality of it. Um, so we'll go over that during that. Um, the recording will be available, slides will be available. I've already copied those scripts that we went over yesterday. Those are copied over into everybody's public share scripts folders on Hypergator. Um, slides have been um, uploaded. I still need to upload the recordings. I need to compress them first and upload them, but then they'll be there as well. And I've attached and shared the Excel files at that link too. Um, if you are a new Hypergator user that you've recently signed up for an account um, and you haven't gone through any of the trainings, please send me an email and contact me so that we can go ahead and set up your one-on-one -on -one trainings. Um, this will include, if you're not familiar with Command Line and you, and you haven't worked in Command Line before, um, we'll set up a Linux one-on-one -on -one training with you so that you can start working on Hypergator. We'll also set up a call to set up your compute environment, install things that I recommend um, that are required for some of our scripts and pipelines to work. Uh, it's a short call, and then we can also go through, if you're not familiar with uh, the base based command line interface, we'll also go through that as well, so you know how to pull in um, FASTQ data, as well as any kind of results, for example, from like the Dragon uh, COVID lineage app, you can pull those over using the base based command line interface as well. All right, and with that, I'll take any questions. You can also put questions in the chat if you have any. Hey, Sarah, Brian from Tennessee. Um, hey. Confused about you, you run the Vader to um, check if there's any mutations, and then you, there's a uh, pop down in the NCBI to say ignore known mutations. Are those both the same thing? So, yeah. are you talking about the NCBI, like the yes or no option to automatically reject flag samples? Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, so so y'all are running yeah, the, the flag is C2 pipeline. So yeah, Vader's already being run. And so um, 
it's not exactly the same thing, but essentially if you've already pre-screened them with Vader and you're using the, the current version, regardless of hitting yes or no, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have any flag samples, but you know, you never know NCBI might support it too. If you choose yes, and for whatever reason you do have a flag sample, you shouldn't, but if you do, they're just going to reject that sample and you're going to have to resubmit it using the no option. So that's why I always choose the no option um, because you shouldn't have any flag samples, but if you do, it's going to be something incredibly minor. That might be something, a slight difference in whatever GenBank's looking at versus the version of Vader that you ran. And it's something, it's, it might be like one sample. I've had it happen a couple times and it was literally one sample and it was because there was an N at the very beginning of the sequence. It wasn't the, it wasn't like the first sequence or the first phase because that gets trimmed off, but it was like the second or third and it was like tripping up some flag saying that the sequence similarity was off because there was a couple in there. And all I had to do was just look at it and go, oh, it's just an N. And I just put no. And I sent them an email saying it's just due to those N and they, they passed it. So um, that's what I would recommend you do is just to do no if you're comfortable like opening up the file just to kind of see what the error means. But we're going to go over all of that in detail in part five. Um, so if you don't want to deal with that right now, you can just hit yes. But that's just what the yes and no mean is, is that if, if for whatever reason they do find a sample that they're going to flag, if you choose yes, they're going to reject that one sample and accept everything else. Um, but with no, they'll hold up everything in processing until you send in, send them an email to to address the issue. Uh, I'm not sure we're talking about the same pop down. There's one okay, that says might. there's one that says something to the extent of ignore known issues. Uh, oh, are you talking about Ungisade? Yeah. That, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about an NCBI. So. You're talking about the confirmation options with choice one, two, or three. Yep. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so the first, um, so you'll run Vader. Vader is specific to GenBank. GISAID has not released their annotation pipeline open source, so we don't know exactly what their flags are and why they might reject your, your sequence. If they do reject your sequence, they will tell you why in an email. So, like the first option is their old default, or technically it's their current default, but the old way of doing things where if they flag one of your samples, they're going to reject it, shoot it back in an email, and um, accept everything else. The second option, that's what we're doing here in Florida now. That's our new default. The second option, that means if us as a submitter or any other submitter has ever sent them a confirmation email saying, hey, this frame ship is real, we've confirmed it, here's the information, they keep a record of that so that when they start seeing it. Now, most of those now match up with what Vader used to flag. So Vader is now, um, they've now made those changes to open reading frames 3, 6, 7, 8, 10, where they no longer flag those frame shifts. So most of those line up with that second option in GISAID now, that if you select that second option, they're no longer going to flag most of those frame shift mutations in 3, 6, 8, 10, 7, um, unless it's something brand new that literally no one else has ever seen and confirmed. So they'll mainly line up Vader results and that second option in GISAID will mainly line up, but we can't confirm that it's 100% of the things since they don't tell us what is in their pipeline. If, does that answer your question? Yep, that works. Thanks. Right. Okay. And it looks like there's a question in the chat from Taylor. Uh, oh yeah, we'll need to, um, I made an update to one of the scripts. So if you're already, if you've already been on Hypergate or using these, we just need to make sure to install BioPython. And actually I'll put it in the chat for you. Just sign into Hypergate and literally type this. And then it'll install BioPython and it'll be good to go. So that's just a new dependency. I had a reminder that, to say that to y'all. It's a new dependency that's required for one of those tips. All right, are there any other questions? Well, I'll go ahead and stop the recording and make sure the rest of the materials, slides, everything gets shared with y'all. Um, again, please email me to set up calls, walkthroughs if you have any other questions or want help troubleshooting to make sure that you are comfortable with. I want everybody to be comfortable with submitting consensus assemblies. Um, and then after that, I'll reach back out to everyone and go ahead and schedule the, the next two trainings. So everybody have a good Friday and have a good weekend.